And you said we're overprotecting our children offline and underprotecting them online. So I'll, I'll pick up first your point about how vulnerable we all are to someone saying something about us on social media. When their reputation was sullied, that's painful in a way unlike anything else, unlike physical pain. And when you feel like you've lost status massively and people are laughing at you, that is one of the most painful things that humans can go through. And that very often leads to, fear, to uh, thoughts about suicide. Jonathan, where does this podcast find you? It finds me in my office at Stern. You can see from the purple wall behind me. So I won't say I'm jealous or envious, but I'm like massive jealous and envious. I think you're arguably the most influential scholar in the world right now. Do go on, as you would say. <laughs> I mean, you're every, to, resist, to resist Professor Hyde is futile right now. You are literally <laughs> everywhere. I mean, you're in my Instagram feed. All these famous people are talking about you. I see you on Joe Rogan, which is obviously... You know, the, the, I, I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing, but I know it's mostly a good thing. Congratulations. This is, you're everywhere. Well, thank you. I think I can explain it like this. Um, over my life, as I've picked stocks to invest in, if I simply always did the opposite of what I actually did, I would be a much richer man. I have no ability to pick stocks. But when it comes to picking academic topics to study, because I have a, a kind of an intuitive sense that the world's going to hell for this reason, and I'm going to dig in here and I want to look and I want to trace this out. I have a pretty good track record of that, looking at polarization, looking at emotions like moral disgust, um, and looking at, at you know, the overprotection of kids and the coddling of the American mind. And now what I'm finding is even though a lot of that other stuff had culture war overtones and there was always a left-right dimension, now I've hit on a topic which everyone is seeing, everyone is concerned about, Republicans, Democrats, anyone with children has seen it. And so I find I don't have to persuade people. I just walk in and people say, thank you, yes. Tell us, what, what do we do? What's going on? So yeah, I think I'm really riding. I, I just, I came along with, with this at the right time. The world's going to hell. Our kids are in big trouble. And I hope, I think my book, The Anxious Generation, is the, the clearest and fullest statement of what happened. Yeah, you described it. I read on, I think, one of your feeds that you're pushing out open doors. Um, yeah, so let, let, let's, let's talk about this. When you say the anxious generation, you're talking about Gen Z. You explain in the book how this generation is the first generation to go through puberty with a, and, and you say this open quote, portal in their pockets that can take them into an alternative universe that's exciting, addictive, unstable, and unsuitable for adolescence. Why do you highlight puberty specifically? For a couple of reasons. One is what the data shows us is that uh, millennials are actually doing okay. So if you were born in, you know, millennial generation goes from 1981 to 1995. If you were born in 1992, 93, you're a late millennial, odds are you don't have issues with anxiety. Your people in that year generally have pretty good mental health. But if you were born on the other side of the divide, maybe 1996 and later, so if you're born, say, 1998, 99, you have a much higher likelihood of having depression or anxiety disorders. And uh, I've what I've come to believe, and here I'm drawing on, uh, Gene Twenge was one of the first to call attention to this. The millennials are okay because they didn't get smartphones and Instagram and social media until they were largely done with puberty. They got it in late high school or college, and they're fine. It's the kids who got it in middle school. It's middle school is the beginning of puberty. In puberty, your brain is rewiring very rapidly. It's a period of very rapid brain change. Um, and that's exactly when we should be helping kids to make it through. That's when other cultures have initiation rites and they, they, and they bring kids into the knowledge of what they need to do as adults. But we give them TikTok and say, here, here, kid, your brain's about to st start rewiring. Let's have random weirdos on the internet selected by algorithm for their extremity. Let's have them do the socialization for us. And that's why I think kids who go through puberty on social media, that's where the damage is greatest. Can these things be undone, or is it that it, it, these this neuroses or anxiety um, or desperate need for affirmation, does it get cemented? I mean, is it especially dangerous to be exposing them to this at this sort of formative point in their lives? Well, it is. So the, the period from around age uh, um, eight or nine uh, through about 15, 16 might be a sensitive period for cultural learning. That is, it's a time when things you learn really stick. That's true for language. If you uh, move to a different country, you're exposed to a language before puberty, 
you'll speak it like a native speaker. But if you don't move there till you're 14 or 15, you probably will never speak like a native speaker. So there are sensitive periods. But with that said, I don't want parents whose, whose kids are, are older Gen Z, I don't want them to despair because with the brain, very little is ever set in cement. It, it can be easier or harder to change, but it can still be changed. And so, uh, so I teach a course called Flourishing, a positive psychology course. It's uh, 35, uh, mostly sophomores. They're 19 years old. And a lot of them have anxiety issues. Most of them spend several hours every day on social media. Um, and we get amazing results just by working through how do you get control of your life? How do you regain control of your attention? How do you take that last hour before you close your eyes and make it something that's going to recharge you, not that's going to just you know, keep you up on what so-and-so is saying about so-and-so? And so by working on their morning routine, their evening routine, and especially by shutting down almost all notifications, you know, I tell them you can leave on five, Uber and Lyft, probably you want to leave those on, you want to know if the car is coming, but you don't need breaking news alerts about somebody getting a divorce from somebody else. That's just not something that is worth you giving away your attention to. Uh, so anyway, my point is there's a lot we can do for young people and they want to do it. Uh, a lot we can do to help them regain control of their attention and improve their, their moods. You talk about specific foundational harms, or four of them, of a phone-based childhood. Sleep deprivation, social deprivation, attention fragmentation, and addiction. Walk us through each of those, and if you could stack rank them, what are you most concerned about? Well, the, sort of the, the biggest and most obvious one that hits everybody is, is you know, what's called in economics, the opportunity cost. And so this is kind of like the foundation of the foundations. Um, the opportunity cost is everything that you give up when you commit to something else. So um, recent Gallup data shows that American teens spend five hours a day just on social media, mostly TikTok and YouTube. You add in all the other stuff they're doing on screens, video games, all that, you know, you're up to eight, nine, 10 hours is where the estimates are um, on at, this is the average. And if you can imagine, you know, anybody listening to this program, imagine that you suddenly started spending 10 hours a day on anything that pushes out everything else. There really isn't room. There's no room for books. There's not much room for talking to friends. You have to do it all through the app. So I think the, of the four foundational harms, I think the biggest one is social deprivation. Kids really, really need to be spending a lot of time with other kids and with adults, but they need to be developing their social skills. Uh, that's gotten crushed. Once they move on to phones, you see it in the data, time with friends plunges in the 2010s Young people used to spend a lot more time with their friends than their parents did, but now they spend only a little more time with their friends than their parents do. Something's really wrong there. Now, you might say, oh, well, you know, sure, but they're spending all this time online together. No, no, it does not substitute. It's asynchronous, it's performative, it's one to many. So I think the most important one is the social deprivation. The second one, which is um, also very serious and just really the easiest, is sleep deprivation. Sleep is so important for all of us. In fact, if I could go back in time, I think the, you know, I'm 60 and I never needed a lot of sleep, but I kind of skimped on it because I was so psyched, like, oh, I can, you know, I can have a, a longer work day and don't only need to sleep, you know, four, five, you know, five hours a day. Uh, but now it, it looks like um, uh, when you are sleep deprived, it has long-term effects on your brain and your memory. Certainly for teenagers, they're going to be in a better mood, less anxious, They'll be better at social relationships if they get a good night's sleep. But when kids bring a device into bed with them, and many of them do, the last thing they do before they close their eyes is check their mentions, check their texts. So these things disrupt sleep. Um, very briefly, the third one is uh, um, attention fragmentation. And we all experience that. You and I have uh, our frontal cortices, you know, the frontal cortex developed. I think we're about the same age. They, ours developed in the 70s. Uh, now, yeah, there was you know too much drugs and alcohol and drunk driving. There were all sorts of bad things then. Um, but we got to develop normal executive function. That is, you make a goal, and then you set out to achieve the goal, and then you do it. You, you, you stay on task. You, you learn to focus. And that, that ability really gets locked in in puberty. But if you're constantly being interrupted, and kids get, one study recently found, 257 uh, notifications a day on average. You're constantly getting pinged and distracted, even while you're talking to people, even while you're trying to do your homework. You never develop the capacity to stay on task. So attention fragmentation, even if it doesn't make them depressed, it's going to make them less successful in life, poorer, they won't make as much money, um, and just unable to achieve things.
And then finally, the fourth is addiction. Now, there's a debate in the academic literature whether it's truly an addiction, like cocaine or heroin, and it certainly is chemically not exactly like cocaine and heroin, but behaviorally, it's very much the same as gambling. If you can call gambling an addiction, and many do, I think social media and video games uh, become an addiction. Now, the research is actually pretty clear. It's not the majority who are addicted in that sense, or let's call it a behavioral addiction. The research uses the term problematic use. What percent develop problematic use, a sort of a compulsive use that's interfering with their ability uh, in other life areas, like friendships, the ability to get schoolwork done? And so the numbers generally show anywhere from you know two or three percent, like heavily addi addicted or intense dependency, to around ten or fifteen percent problematic use. That's a lot of kids. Like there's no other consumer product where we said, well, you know, it's it's not necessarily an addiction, but it's going to kind of damage the life prospects of ten or fifteen percent of our kids. Like we would never let them use use it, but this one we do. One of the things <clears throat> I love about your work, and I think is a decent description of insight or even genius is you'll say something and it seems so obvious but at the same time you weren't thinking about it and i had one of those realizations reading your work about this book where you said that online we have these friend groups that have very low cost or easy entry and then low cost exit whereas when 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 we grew up you had uh, high barriers or high cost entry and then high cost exit and it just reminded me when we were kids we kind of slowly but surely shaped the people we were hanging out with and then we just hung out with them all the time we had our crew and some of us didn't like each other or some of us liked each other more but you got into trouble together and that was your crew and i just look back on that 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 friend group i had in junior high school and high school and it played such an enormous role in i just got lucky every one of my crew was going to college so that meant i was going to college but speak more about the importance of kind of this, this your, your crew, your posse, and the difference between developing them or having them online versus offline. So we are a tribal species. This is a major theme of my own research, which I cover in my book, The Righteous Mind. We evolved to live in small groups. These small groups hang together, especially when they're in competition with other groups. This is why sports is so much fun. Remind me, Scott, what athletics you did in high school? I did everything in high school, but not very well, and then I rode crew in college. Okay, but you, but you, you were on teams, and I assume a lot of your yeah. friends and your crew was overlapped with your sports activities, right? 100%. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So especially for boys, girls tend to have uh, more intense pairs. Girls do a lot in pairs and smaller groups. Boys tend to, when you let kids do whatever they want, boys tend to form larger groups, and then part of what they do in those larger groups is compete with other groups. And that can sometimes even escalate to violence. Uh, but usually it's more sports, it's ribbing, it's competition. That's incredibly helpful. We're a tribal species, and the crew you were describing, it's like this is junior tribalism. This is master those skills. And as you said, an important part of it is that you don't necessarily like everyone in the crew. You could have tensions with someone, and you learn to live with it because you can't just press a button and expel them. And it takes a lot of time. This develops over years. And so you wouldn't just burn your bridges. You wouldn't just quit because it's going to take you years. You may never get another crew. Contrast that with what Gen Z has gone through. We don't let them out very much, so they don't get to hang out with other kids very much. Um, for boys, you know, if they, they really enjoy playing video games, the video games are amazing. But for boys, they can't go over to each other's houses if they want to play video games. They literally have to go home to their own house and sit alone with their headset, their controller, their screen if they want to play with other boys. So over and over again, this could be a major theme of our conversation today. The internet has made almost everything that kids need to do super easy to do, low cost, easy, low embarrassment, and in the process, you don't have to exert much effort, you don't learn any skills, you don't develop abilities that transfer outside of that closed digital world. Talk about the decline of free play. So that is, that's the other half of this. You know, my basic argument in the book is that humans had a play-based childhood uh, from hundreds of millions of years because we're mammals and that's what mammals do. So play is extremely important for brain development, for developing skills. That's why animals play. That's why they take risks. That's why human children seek out risk. So we must have play and risk and thrill and excitement. Boys especially need rough and tumble play, physical play, wrestling, things like that. And we had that until the 1980s or 90s. Um, you and I grew up during a giant crime wave. 
Um, there were risks. There were drunk drivers. Uh, but kids still played outside, got into trouble, and learned to get out of trouble. In the 90s, we freaked out about child abduction. We started focusing much more on the competition in our economy to get into a good college. Childhood became, as it is in East Asia, childhood becomes test prep for some circles of Americans. Uh, we lose the interest in free play. Kids get less and less recess. We think they need more math, less recess. That was wrong. So for a whole variety of reasons, we greatly cut down on, the, on what kids really desperately need, which is unsupervised free play, where they will learn how to make rules, norms, develop relationships, manage relationships. We cut down on all of that, and the millennials were victims of that. The millennials, the older millennials had free-range childhoods generally, but by the, if you're born in the early 90s, you probably had some restrictions. Even still, they didn't get particularly depressed. It's only when the second piece comes in, which is the phone-based childhood, and that just sweeps in in the blink of an eye. It wasn't there in 2008, 2009, in the first years of the iPhone. Um, but by 2015, most kids have a smartphone, not a flip phone. And so what I'm calling in the book, the great rewiring of childhood, it has a backstory in the 80s and 90s about the loss of play. But the peak of the action is 2010 to 2015. That's the period when human childhood, not just in our country, but in many developed countries, human childhood leaves the real world and comes to take place primarily through phones and other digital devices. In the book, you mentioned or you referenced French sociologist Emile Durkheim. I'm not My sure if I'm saying that correctly. Of all time. That's so interesting. Really. That says a lot when you say that. But the concept you highlight is... Enemy, I'm not sure, or normalness Enemy, yes, in French English. Word, yes. uh, say more about this research and how it helps illustrate some of the things that you're discussing. So the reason I'm so grateful to, uh, to Durkheim, uh, I, I never took a sociology course in college. Uh, and then in graduate school at Penn, I, sat, I took one course on criminology. It was just, I don't know why I picked that course. But the professor assigned Emil Durkheim's classic text, Suicide, uh, where Durkheim had studied suicide statistics in Europe in like the 1890s when they were just beginning to gather statistics. And he observed certain patterns. And he observed that people are tightly bound into communities like Orthodox Jews, religious Catholics. They had much lower levels of suicide, whereas people who had a lot of freedom, especially in the Protestant countries, they were more likely to feel disoriented, not tied in, not connected. Uh, and they were more likely to suffer from anomie or normlessness uh, it, it's not a good feeling of freedom to be freed from social norms. It's disorienting. And so this was just a revelation to me that to see that actually, you know, freedom isn't like, of course we need freedom in many ways, but we don't need the maximum freedom possible. We actually need to be bound in to flourish. And so Durkheim has just helped me see that a lot of what we're doing is we're trying to create groups. That's what religion is for, he said. That's why we love sports teams and sports and sports super fandom. And, the, and it really helped me to see that the digital world has atomized everything. It's split everything. It's allowed me to see that even television used to be social because you sit there, you watch it with your sisters or brothers, you fight, you argue, you eat food, you talk about it. But now kids, even if they go over to each other's houses, they might be sitting separate on their separate screens watching separate, separate videos. So. Um, Durkheim really allowed me to see atomization, splitting, the loss of meaning. And this is something you see in the data. This is the saddest part of all the graphs. I've got like 30 graphs in the book. There are several graphs of what young people say in response to questions. One of them is a statement, um, sometimes I feel my life has no meaning. Do you, do you agree with that, disagree with it? And for, uh, for all these questions, or sometimes I think I'm no good at all. And on all these questions, the lines were pretty flat in the 2000s and pretty low. Most students don't, don't agree with that. But all of a sudden, around 2012, 2013, all of those lines go up. As soon as our kids moved their social lives online, they began to wallow in despair, disconnection, anomie, normlessness, depression, and suicide. It's, I mean, it's just, um, I, I think of this, we don't, we don't like to, it's especially rough, I think, on adolescents, but I wonder, and I'm curious if you feel this way, I don't like to admit that a lot of the things you're talking about have impacted me. Tell me more about which ones did you recognize in yourself? 
Well, I, I don't like to admit this, but my mental health, when I think about any mental health episodes I've had in the last three years, half of them have been triggered by something online, by a total stranger. Someone comes after me for some of my work or tries to discredit me, and I, I don't even know if it's a bot. And a bunch of people who, for whatever reason, you know, agree or don't feel good about me weigh in, and it just triggers uh, a, a downward spiral. And I, I think a lot of times that successful people and men who have some weird notion of masculinity and success and like to think that we're immune from these types of body blows, you know, I, 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 I think about how much it's impacted me, and then I think about my kids and the fact that they haven't built up scar tissue or they have no real ability or perspective or life experience to be able to deal with this. And you just think, you just think, Jesus Christ, how, how are we letting this happen to our kids? Talk about the disconnect. It seems so obvious. And I think your work and Gene Twenge's work is sort of bringing us into the light or the realization of just how damaging this is. But what's interesting is the contrast. And you talk about this. One of the things you said that I just thought was so illuminating, you said we're overprotecting our children offline and underprotecting them online. So I'll, I'll pick up first your point about how vulnerable we all are to someone saying something about us on social media. So, you know, I read, I, I love Stoicism. I use Stoicism in my flourishing class. Uh, Marcus Aurelius has some great quotes about that. You know, why do you make yourself vulnerable to whatever anybody would say about you? Um, many of us like to think that we're tough and maybe you're physically strong. Maybe you can handle a lot of physical pain. But even the ancients, you know, Roman times, um, when their reputation was sullied, that's painful in a way unlike anything else, unlike physical pain. And when you feel like you've lost status massively and people are laughing at you, that is one of the most painful things that humans can go through. And that very often leads to, fear, to uh, thoughts about suicide. Uh, we, we just naturally think about, well, uh, let me just vanish. Let me disappear. This is unbearable. Nobody likes me. So this is true for adults. And these were, you know, Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of the Roman Empire, you know, he was subject to these, these feelings. Now let's look at, a, you know, 11, 12, 13-year-old girls and boys. They're coming out of childhood. They have to renegotiate their status. Who's cool? Who's attractive? Who's high? Who's low? And kids always did that. But in this sort of the slow, local way that you and I were talking about before, now you suddenly, it's like you supercharge it. It's like you say, let's take all the all the difficult parts of middle school, let's multiply all the bad parts by 10. And this is gonna take up almost all of your life. Most of your time in middle school will be spent not having fun, not learning in class. It's gonna be spent managing your brand. You are gonna be desperately, desperately managing your brand. One false move and you're down. These are natural, normal psychological processes that these platforms have knowingly hacked. And there are quotes from some of the early people at Facebook and elsewhere. Um, you know, we, you know, that they, that they, th these were hackers tricks to, to, to play on our insecurities, see what someone said about you, click here. So yeah, we, we all care about our reputations and social media makes us all live on thin ice. It's not a happy way to live. We'll be right back. One of the things you do in the book, and I think the thing that's getting arguably the most play, is you've outlined a series of pretty actionable solutions. Speak to those, Jonathan. Yeah. So I'm not doing any of that. I, well, I'm not doing that stuff about how to make the time less toxic. What I'm saying is the reason why our 10 and 11 year olds have iPhones is only because everybody else gave their kids an iPhone. We're all in a trap. And uh, this is called a collective action problem. Um, or a commons dilemma in the social sciences. And they're very hard to get out of as individuals because if you say, no, nope, sorry, I read this book by John Hyde and uh, you know, I'm not giving you a phone until you're 97 or you know, I'm not gonna give you, you know, I'm not Good gonna give you a that. smartphone until you're in high school, as Hyde says. <laughs> yeah. Well, if your kid is the only one without a smartphone, the only one without uh, social media, then yeah, your kid will be isolated. It's gonna be tough. And so the solutions that I propose are all things we can do together to liberate our kids from the social action problems. Very briefly, four steps, four norms. No smartphone before high school, just give them a flip phone. The millennials were fine with flip phones. Two is no social media till 16. Social media is just not suitable for minors, frankly. It certainly isn't suitable in early puberty. Let them get most of the way through puberty before you invite them to stick their head in a toilet bowl and flush every day forever and ever. Third norm is phone-free schools. 
the phone is the greatest distraction device ever invented. Kids text during class, they watch videos during class, they watch porn during class. It's completely insane that there are schools in this country, namely most of them, almost all of them, that allow kids to keep their phones in their pockets during the day. And they just say, don't take it out during class, but they do take it out during class. So uh, the phones need to be locked up in a phone locker or yonder pouch, first thing, they get them back at the end. They have six hours, seven hours a day to listen to their teachers, talk to each other, make jokes, flirt, have fun. So that's the third norm, phone preschools. And the fourth norm is far more free play, independence, and responsibility in the real world. This is the harder one because we have to overcome our own anxieties. But we, we, if we're going to take away the phones from, especially in middle school, if we're going to reduce their time on screens, we have to give them something to do. And the healthiest thing they can do is hang out, play with each other unsupervised. Let them learn how to work out conflicts uh, and, and choose activities. If we do those, I'm confident that we would see these lines, these incredibly surging lines of anxiety and depression. They just go up, up, up. They never go down since 2012. If we do these four things, I'm pretty confident we're going to see those lines come down. We're going to actually reverse the mental health epidemic. Do you feel like you've gotten tra any traction? Do you think it's realistic to think we might have this outbreak of schools banning phones? Do you think it's a real possibility? Oh, it's happening. It's absolutely happening. Um, so in fact, this is the easiest one to do because this is one where schools can just make the decision themselves or boards of education for school districts can make the decision themselves. All the principals hate the phones. All the teachers hate the phones. It's making their lives miserable. It's interfering with learning. So they want to do it. They just, I say, well, why don't you do it? They always say the same thing because some of the parents will freak out. They feel they have to, they have a right to communicate with their child during math class all the time. So it's just overcoming parental objection. But now that more parents are seeing the problem, now that we're past COVID, now we can see the mess is not because of COVID. It, it, was, it was baked in before COVID. COVID actually didn't have a long lasting impact. Um, now that parents are turning and supporting this, uh, and the research is getting stronger and stronger, and it's clear that there are huge no, that there are learning deficits now around the world, not just in the U.S. Now the appetite has turned, and phone uh, many schools are banning phones. The U.K. just mandated uh, phone-free schools throughout this throughout the school day throughout throughout England and the, and uh, other parts of the U.K. Um, Australia has done it. Um, Florida just did it a couple of days ago. DeSantis signed the bill. I think that was yesterday. So this is happening. This will improve educational outcomes. And guess what? The kids love it. They, some of them object at first. But what they're most afraid of isn't being off social media. It's being off social media when everyone else is on. Jonathan Haidt is the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at New York University Stern School of Business. His research focuses on moral and political psychology, as described in his book, The Righteous Mind. His latest book, The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness, is out now. He joins us from New York University. Uh, Professor Haidt, I look forward to seeing you. All of your colleagues are just so proud of you. Anyways, congratulations on everything, Jonathan. Thanks so much, Scott. It's always fun to talk with you. I really appreciate your work and your friendship. 